Welcome to The Ones Who Live, a TWD podcast with your hosts, Takira Lawrence, Jill Roby, Kirsten Nakuna, and Sarah Beth Pollock. If you're wondering who I am, stop whatever you're doing and head over to Squawking Dead to listen to side A of this episode. That being said, I'm Dave, and I'll be your narrator for side B, the second half of the collaborative discussion between Squawking Dead and The Ones Who Live, a TWD podcast. We're taking on the fourth episode of The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live, titled What We. And without further ado, so I have to tell you guys a story. I was watching the episode on Sunday, I think it was. And I get to the part where Rick basically says they took Carl and I got so emotional. I made a noise. I'm in this room here. Evelyn's in the other room with a wall separated with the door closed. And she goes, are you OK? I don't answer because I'm too busy blubbering. <laughs> she comes in. She goes, did you hear me? Are you OK? I have headphones on. You OK? I said, oh, I'm fine. That's how emotional I got over that moment. It was just like the last episode is completing a circle. Mm-hmm. They started it in the last episode. And they completed in this one. And when she pulled out the phone oh, yeah. and did it exactly like you said, with the with the eye bandage for yep. all of us, probably mostly. But I said, no, she does, he doesn't want to remember him that way. Bullshit. He wants to remember him, period. I couldn't handle it. it just yeah. hit me so hard. That was rough. This is definitely the episode where Andy should be nominated and win for leading actor in a limited drama series for an Emmy and a Golden Globe. Not that Saturn bullshit. <laughs> Yeah, true. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> even a 100 and the numbers and the writing and that, everything backs it up, everything tracks. So there's no reason for them to not at least be nominated. I don't even get emotional fiction like that. And they took Carl. That broke me. And I've watched that scene a lot of times because I clearly like to hurt myself, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Almost more the second time for me. Yet again, like the last episode, saw it the second time, hurt even more than the first time. I you know. know it's coming. And it goes back to the clips. And they oh. Have those, oh. Yeah. And the little boy just disappears. Like, what are you guys doing? Oh, uh, I couldn't. Ugh. I know. It really hurt. It really, really Put hurt. a scar on my heart. I'm so glad that we're getting these connecting pieces. The mention of Jocelyn. I'm sure that's what you guys were just talking about. And then we also get the whole thing with Daryl. The fact that Daryl was also looking because that was such a big part mm-hmm. of his story. The stuff that was happening while Rick was gone. It's important and it was important to us as viewers. And so I'm glad that they intertwined it. And it doesn't feel like just fan service. It furthers call the it fan story. At all. We meet Rick as a father, as a dad. Most important person to him for most of the time he was on the show was Carl. His reasonings for being afraid and losing Carl all over again in his head. I wouldn't call that fan service. And I know a lot of people probably will do that. I'm sure that'll be said. It went well with the story. It fit well within Mm. the parameters of what they're trying to tell. So it didn't feel schlocky or like off-putting in any way. And Carl is his son. So why wouldn't he be Mm -hmm. mentioned? Just because he died, he's never mentioned again. I know that's something that they like to do on this show, but... (laughs) Carl was fairly important. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, they're going to come for me. (laughs) I was saying in Gone, the second episode, how Michonne could have brought up to Nat how Daryl had gone off and looked for Rick for too long as an example of knowing when to go. Mm. But isn't it interesting how they transplanted that thought that I had and put it in this episode to make more of an impact, to delay that gratification? And then explaining, I had to stop looking for you. I had to give birth to RJ. I had to take care of Judith. But one thing I want to hit even more on what you said, Bridget, in the last episode, you had said people's faces start to disappear. I don't want that to go unnoticed. You said it yourself. And that's what happened to Rick. You don't have an iPhone, literally, to look at a picture of Carl. You don't have a rendering. Carl disappeared during the apocalypse. And like Judith said in season nine, I'm starting to forget what they look like, or I'm starting to forget what he what he looked like. We're so blessed to live in a time period in which that isn't a reality for us because we have access to photos. 200 years ago, when photography was really just for the elite, because those were the only people who could afford it or afford to have portraits painted of themselves because that wasn't something that you could have done. That's how it went. When I try to remember what my dad looked like, and he only passed four years ago, but when I try to think back to what he looked at, just purely from memory, that's my father. Purely from memory, it starts to get foggy over time, but I have photography to go back to. I have that luxury. The story is set in a time in which they don't have that luxury. There's something really poetic and, uh, and heartfelt and sad about that, and I know that it's often used as a device in literature. It's interesting that it's flipped because it's usually 
children who lose their parents will lose the memory of what their parents look like in literature that's usually what it is so it's it's interesting that it's the opposite here it's the parent there's something really beautiful about it i'm glad that we got to see the little benjiro drawing of carl that's it now he gets to hold on to that enjoy peace rick well until he gets home because there's actual photos of him in alexandria oh yeah the render the uh paintings right no no he took a picture with oh yeah that's right that's right with the polaroid Mm. oh yeah Mm -hmm. smart kid it's probably video somewhere maybe I hope so. That'd be a nice surprise. <laughs> maybe from the interviews yeah. that Deanna did. Oh, maybe those are still around. Hopefully they took more videos after that. In I the AMC so. archives. <laughs> wink, wink. Give us some of that. Family gatherings. Oh, that's, that's what we would do. So Michonne finally filled Rick in on what he's gained. RJ? I think Rick did the filling. <laughs> <sighs> do you think at some point they'll have a conversation about who they've lost or who Michonne is aware that they lost anyway i kind of hope not oh. I, don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't really enjoy that possibility who did they lose by the time she left jesus well really sadiq for one was jesus. she around sadiq? for that that was, was during whisper yeah. let's start with the pikes tara jesus one of the last few memories was with enid cutting off aaron's arm i keep thinking ross god damn it <laughs> <laughs> i'm forgetting his face oh no mm. Sadiq was really who popped into my head first, though. Sadiq is, yeah, there you go. Personally, I don't think so. I think she's probably more interested in hearing his story, and he's probably more interested in learning about his kids than first things first. The sad things like, oh, by the way, so these people died. <laughs> you know the guy that your son died for? He's right? dead. <laughs> like we kind of want to see some of that, but he's gonna Do find we? out. Do we need to? see the actual see i don't think we need to find out about it either i just wonder if it would be a, a bigger driving force for him to get back home and protect who's still there and she can tell him about all the new people that they have right yeah. right post time jump oh and then bernie <laughs> we forgot oh but he died in the first episode <laughs> bernie. <laughs> bernie. bernie with his colorful shirt it's a bernie with his paisley Damn, shirt he's a real guy he died in that well he we, he was undead he was stradivarius dead excuse me <laughs> <laughs> well we didn't know we didn't know you know what she tells him what happened to scott and then we finally get to know scott yeah. Where's he Where been, is scott? who is scott, <laughs> scott? are you for real it's uh right Sine- uh Sinequa's husband are you for oh, real uh, right kenrick now? green that's yeah. how i remember him <laughs> kenrick <laughs> green it's kenrick green <laughs> come on what did happen here? anyway sorry listen there's so many names on this show and rachel and has Barbara. a whole rolodex of oh god shut the hell up <laughs> Where's Barbara? Where's that ginger? Speaking of something that has been racking our brains, unfortunately, because it's such a dumb conversation, we got a little bit closer to figuring out the timeline. Oh, yeah. By way of a couple of indicators. One was Michonne being seven months pregnant when the episode Scars happens. Basically, we may be just about 11, maybe plus years into the apocalypse based on that information alone. He's almost eight. Takes nine months usually for a child to be born. <laughs> and this is seven months after it. Rick was helicoptered away. Okay. It gives you a sense of when he left the show. You could say maximum when he was airlifted off the show was three years in. It's fair. It's on the middle side of the what would be three plus or the middle of Definitely the low side, three which plus. would be two and a half years. So you're saying this, is, this kind of lines up with the Commonwealth? Maybe just about. No. There was a year between the first appearance of the Whispers and then the Whisper War. Or there's an encounter, they go away after the Pikes, a season changes, they come back, Rosita has a baby, so there's another year. Mm. So <laughs> that's when the Whisper-ish, whispery things happen, the actual ones. Basically, the Silence of the Whispers a saga. Either way, whatever has been happening on the home front is irrelevant. As far as locking down numbers... We're about 11 years in from the fall, essentially. And you know what? Better than Judith, RJ is so much a better lock on the timeline now because of these hard numbers. He's mm-hmm. just, he's almost eight. Yeah. And that's way better than what we've been working with. You know, talk about using kids as your yardstick. I think we should all be happy about that because <laughs> after all these years, looking at either Judith, because babies from birth, it's a little easier, but we didn't get to see RJ being born. But babies are a really great indicator of time passing. That's all they're good for. Thank you. Oh my gosh. JK. JK. On this show. It's just a long running joke. 
Oh, don't you go saying <laughs> what to me? We should eat kids in the apocalypse. That no. wasn't me. Yeah. I'll throw you under. Not you. Oh, I thought I it was, was like, Rachel. I, I heard go. No, what? I said what? <laughs> oh, I wasn't looking at the right person. Well, it counts up kids and what they're good for. Judas served a lot of purposes instead of just telling time. She helped break down Michelle's emotional walls all the way back at the prison. That broke a wall that Michelle didn't know she still had up. After the fall of the prison, when Rick and Carl thought she was dead, they kind of had this thing in common. Rick experienced that death as if, as if it was genuine. She wasn't dead, but he believed she was dead, like losing his child in that horrible, she got eaten kind of way. That's what happened to Andre, right? So mm. it's a lot of connecting threads there. You just brought up something mm -hmm. that I had actually written down about this episode. It's something that Rick says that's very palpable, along with taking away Carl from me and then his face disappearing. There was something about what he said. What you said reminds me uh, something about what Morgan said in season eight when Henry goes missing. He doesn't go out and search for him like Carol did because he was afraid to find him dead. It would be better off in his mind that he doesn't know and not see his undead corpse around because he wouldn't be able to handle it but what he basically says to michonne is it was easier for me to just go along knowing that you're possibly still alive and kicking because the thought of me having to confront the reality of this world it's too much for him to handle and he'd have to die all over again he couldn't be able to handle it i can go on not really having knowing the actual truth about what's happening back home just knowing that you're out there a force to be reckoned with to begin with but knowing that death comes for us all or this walking dead universe is awful. Well, do you think maybe part of the reason Rick was resistant to going back also was he lost Carl, even though he was there. If he doesn't go home, then in his head, always RJ and Judith are alive. It's Schrodinger's RJ. Yeah, no, that's what Bridget yeah. said in the last yeah. episode. It's Michonne's Ms. What, Schrodinger. Schrodinger's Michonne. Ms. Schrodinger's. <laughs> it's Schrodinger's Michonne. If he were to go back home and CRM or whoever showed up and then took them out and he had to see that, he wouldn't survive that. He was able to shut down part of his brain before and he could just believe they were okay. But if he had to see that they, oh, wait, no, they're not okay. He wouldn't come back from that. And I, I get that. He already learned how to die. He, <laughs> I don't think he could go on living with that. Yeah, not knowing for sure that harm had come to them. No, absolutely not. I he love how he phrased that too. I learned how to die. I don't think I could learn how to die again. He's the walking dude. Yeah. Again, they said it without saying it. <laughs> we are... <laughs> But I like the way Thorne said it. They're not gone. We're gone. That stuck with me. And I proceeded to pound my chest every single time I said it, too, <laughs> which almost which I had to edit a little bit because it was too loud. Is your time up with us? Yeah, I was like just by 50 minutes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you the, for staying. Yeah, a long chat. Can't wait to see what they do in five and six. Mm -hmm. it's, I just assume it's going to be better than the last. And I think they should sweep the awards for episode four specifically. Also, episode one. Honestly, Andy's just the best I've ever seen him, in my personal opinion. Rick and Michonne's love cannot be denied. <laughs> I'll allow it. <laughs> no objections, Your Honor. Yeah, I do not object. Judge Hawthorne. I don't object. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you for showing up. Throwing goddamn nuggets from the old show to reinforce this show just tickled me. I'm so happy that we got to finally do something together and I hope we do it again sometime. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Thanks yeah, everyone. Thank it you, was Jill. nice meeting you, Jill. Nice, nice meeting you meeting too. You. Beautiful. What a treat. That was great. Okay. <laughs> so I had another thought. Before you continue, what did you think about the 11 years, the 11-ish years? Does that feel right? I feel in my gut we're closer to 12. It's such a minor difference. But while we were watching this episode, realizing that Rick has been with CRM for six years across the board at least from the start yeah at least okay. er, yeah, at least he has been with crm the longest longer, longer right. than any of our characters longer than his children longer than michonne throughout this entire apocalypse so i can see how i don't want to say easy easy is not the right word but i can see why he is so conditioned and why he sides with them why he's so Stockholm syndrome, Loyal. basically. He, mm -hmm. Yeah. She says it. When the jail leaves the door open, you don't stay in the jail when they're letting you go. Really? Ask Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> he did. That guy needed a jail. He needed a timeout. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so did Rick. Yeah. I don't know that he's totally 100% back to himself yet, but I think he is now aware 
of how disconnected he's been. Michonne really threw the mirror up in front of his face, I think. And I think these next two episodes, we're going to see him getting back to who we know as Rick Grimes. Well, that's what I loved about the juxtaposition of the end of the episode to the beginning. There's mm-hmm. all this tension at the beginning and they're arguing and there's all these one liner quips against each other and stuff. <laughs> and Commando was my favorite, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. And then Rachel and I were going back and forth about that yeah. <laughs> and then, yesterday. At the end, you can even tell in the choreography that they chose for the fight scenes as they're leaving the building. It's right unified. End, yeah. Everything that they're doing is like together. It's-, it's like they're riding a bicycle and they just fall right back in, at back into how you never forget your body. It's muscle memory. They're going right back to what they used to do. Do you remember the scene before they get to the prison? The time jump in which we find out Lori's pregnant and then we get that time jump where she's really pregnant and it's like the episode <laughs> that they find the prison. They're so used to being out in the world they knock on the door make sure no one's in there and then they file in a specific way and then as soon as someone sees a walker they're like oh get up and go and then they all go and it's really uniform and everything is really finely tuned and they've been able to craft the the way that works best for them and what keeps them safe it's the same thing that we're seeing it's that finely tuned this is what keeps us safe we know what movement the other one is going to make so we can go for the other walker so they're back in sync dance partners yes and then so we get that choreography which is beautiful and i'm so excited and so happy to see it and then we get levity in the end of the episode all of a sudden the colors are brighter they're outside this brightly colored car that they get into ish (laughs) yellow as bright as it's gonna get zombie dust all over it but we get this juxtaposition of like this happy and then all of a sudden this song comes in i have the song lyrics in the song i lose it every time that song comes on because it's so amazing at the end which one though it's a beautiful song and it's perfect the, the for... one at the end yes oh so let me by Son- somi 2017 no i was talking or about the, is it a, a sibe happy a sibe happy yeah it's that's really what great. i was talking about because that one's like both Afri- african artists too yes so this is fyi mm-hmm It's just very upbeat and happy, but you get that. And then they're leaving. She finally got him to agree. You could end this season here and I'd be like, again, yeah, Mm -hmm. you could end the series here. (laughs) Yeah, I'd be like, yeah, great. Love it. Thank you. Like the only episode you couldn't end that on was maybe three because the cliff. Yeah, yeah. right. But man, this yeah, every single which what does that mean? I've never experienced a show where you could have ended the series. I wouldn't need to see any more after that point. They ride off into the sunset. I'm fine. <laughs> I've, I honestly have never felt that watching any other show. These little vignettes that make so much sense. They could have ended the first season of Westworld where they ended it. And it would have been, I mean, in a, in a storytelling sense. I like season two. But what I'm saying is the way they ended season one was they could have just left it right there. They didn't have to come back. It was perfect. Isn't there something to be said about that? There's something beautiful in the writing and the way that this story was crafted. Yeah. Do I want to see more? Of course I want to see more. But if you ended it here, I wouldn't be upset because at least I would know that they were together. Yeah. And you know what? This episode wasn't extraordinarily long, too. It felt long. It felt drawn out. It felt painful in some spots to watch. And yet they gave you enough funny, gave you enough payoff Mm -hmm. in between the fights, even though it was a bottle episode. See, You'd think this that this is episode writing, was over though. an hour. This is good writing. You know I'm so anti-bottle episode and so over the anthology. I got so right. mad about the bottle episodes. Be more specific. You are more anti-bottle episodes or anthology style episodes from Fear. Maybe it was just Fear. I don't know. Maybe it was just because, Fear. Because, well, it bothered me in that and it bothered me in 10C. Oh. Anyway, I didn't, I didn't love So COVID 10C. bothers you. Uh, yes. <laughs> It's so many ways. I'm not a fan of the bottle episode either. I'm, 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 not. I'm not either. You but weren't, this, yeah. Yeah, you, no. this voiced. was so well yeah. done and so well written that I didn't even think of it as a bottle episode. I just thought you it, felt movement because it basically. furthered the story. It furthered the overall arch of the story. That's what you're looking for. I'm looking for story arc development. I'm not looking for you to just <laughs> piddle around on a side quest. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, and that's the thing. I think writers are inherently cognizant of the bottle episode. And how it has to move the story forward. It has to develop the characters too. Mm -hmm. Or else don't do it. (laughs) Exactly. No, this is a great example. Or at least bookend it with a bigger ensemble. Please, anybody, if you're going to write a bottle episode, please look at this episode and hold this as the standard to which you should be trying to achieve. Thank you, Danai Guerrera. 
<laughs> well, I, well, for yes. the writing, yes. yes, it's important to thank you, Takira. It's important to remember that Denai mm -hmm. wrote this just soup to nuts, wrote, show run the whole episode. Mm -hmm. So this is her creation. And honestly, this is one of my favorite episodes, the most favorite episode. I loved the first episode. I loved the insane risky payoffs that they introduced in that episode. I want to also say, I don't know if you guys noticed this, and I was going to bring this up in the last few episodes, but there were moments in every episode thus far, the first four, where it felt like it, they could have ended it before the actual end. Did you get that sense when watching these episodes? There was like an end or like a you know, fade to black. And it's like, well, you know, they could end it here. But then they kept going. Yeah, there were some moments like that. Especially the second episode. Akila said it. She say, said, is the episode, episode over? Two. And then it came back on. There's that feeling like it ends and yet it keeps going. And then it's like, oh, thank you for keeping going. Just continuing because you've given us so much more. Do you want to go through the songs before we have to not do anything else? Because they're very cool. First of all, very upbeat, like you said, happy. Songs are good. Let me go through the first two before I go back to the beginning of the episode with the other song. Asibe Happy is from DJ Maforisa. Ami Faku KBZA. No, and I think I, I think I missed a, a vowel somewhere. Maybe I wrote down the lyrics. Okay. Yes, I got the translation. <laughs> it's literally we are happy. We are in love. Mm -hmm. They have tried to separate us. They failed. Our ancestors agree we are a fit. So like destined from the stars stuff. The two of us, let us be happy together. Be happy. The hook is let's be happy, my person. Let's be happy together. Let's be happy, my person. Let's be happy together. The music oh, pairs very awesome. nicely with the simple, just we're meant to be together. You are my person. We're meant to be together. Mm -hmm. Now, wait. The Let Me by Somi, the lyrics are just let me. Let me look back into my own heart. Is that the one that plays during the credits? For the credits, yes, okay, okay. exactly. Let me hold myself with my own hand. Let me tell my secrets to myself. Let me kneel and pray for my own grace. Let me hold on. Let my lips be the ones to taste the truth. Let it be myself to hear my blues. Let me quiver naked, dark, and alone. Let my mirrors be close like skin and bone and heart. Let me hold on. Let me. That one, I should have gotten the meaning for. That was the last song. I, the lyrics are, I wrote down. It's a little harder to figure out what's being said here. Because she's basically saying, let me stand on my own and hold myself with my own hand. Let me stand on my own two feet. Let me tell secrets to myself. Let me kneel and pray for my own grace. I'm not entirely sure what that means. Isn't that just, I'm not going to let them decide for me what my life is? Okay. Anyone else who tries to tell me otherwise. I would assume that's what it is. Like, I'm taking control over this situation again. They're yeah. not going to tell me who to be. I'm not Dana Bethune like da anymore. Oh, you, oh you, you fished it. That's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. Yeah. The uh, arbiter in the, in the house of God. Let no man be my judge in the house of God. I only answer to one master. In, in this case, it's myself, but it's nice to play with. Ooh. Okay, let's go back to the beginning, though, because the beginning is a, the beginning is more of a Rick thing. So first of all, the, the song that's playing is playing in the apartment. It's confirmed, actually. It zooms in on the radio, but it zooms out to give you a sense of geography about the lonely apartment. But we're hearing it in the helicopter because that's where head, that's where they're heading. It's uh, 1973. It's not mm -hmm. that old. It's not that old. Uh, it's tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree by Tony Orlando and Don. Yeah. So the song is from a perspective of a man returning home after three years in prison and looking anxiously for an, an agreed upon sign that the woman he loves would welcome his return. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful imagery for what Rick is going through right now. He's been away for so long. Is he going to be? He's like skittish. He does. I Maybe I shouldn't come home. I don't know if she wants me anymore. All the things that she says in this episode about, do you even love me anymore? And he goes, always. But the same is in reverse. Maybe he feels like I'm gone. I can't come back from this. You know, there is no me left to love. And the ribbon that they're talking about is obviously the yellow ribbon for the, for the people coming home, the veterans coming home from war also. So that's the yellow ribbon usually typically associated that with That was them. what I always thought the song was about, was about someone coming home from war. Yeah, I picked up a link of this particular reference from history.com this day in history tie yellow ribbon around the old oak tree tops the u.s pop charts and creates a cultural phenomenon based on the idea of people coming home from war oh so wait and, this uh, song triggered that yeah oh that's cool basically. okay so not the yep. other way around okay i didn't know that or re-triggered that or a link to the article in the blog it does reference it's more focused on the veterans part mm -hmm. than it is technically about the song part but it has roots in that phenomenon to let people know that it's okay to come home, essentially. They would 
tie ribbons in the lamp posts and the trees and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, they tied the yellow ribbons to their hair so that other men don't try to hit on them because that's because they're off in war. They're taken, you know, so even if they were like in a boyfriend, girl, girlfriend situation, I'm taken. We're going I'm steady. Promised. We're going. Yeah, exactly. Oh, one more tiny little fa- factoid. Matthew Negretti is consulting producer on the show. Mm-hmm. And for those of you who may or may mm-hmm. not know, Matthew Negretti was a producer what? on The Walking Dead, but also was executive producer and showrunner of, of Tales. I mean, uh, World Walking... Beyond. <laughs> World Beyond. I was like, that's World... not quite right. No, no. He, he World did, Beyond. He did, like, wait, what? he did direct some it, of the right, episodes. He did some of the episodes. Yeah. 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 Walking Dead, World Beyond. Tapped directly from The Walking Dead. He exited The Walking Dead and went straight on to Walking Dead, World Beyond. And then the pandemic hit, et cetera, et cetera. I just wanted to say, me and Richie would have totally been making out in that broke ass, about to fall to the floor elevator. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Finally, somebody speaking up. God, <laughs> hey Jill. I'm like, it's been a billion <laughs> years since we've seen each other. We have a kid that he doesn't know about. I've risked my life and lost a lot of time looking for him. I actually found him. We in this crazy ass building and now i finally got him to his senses we are making out in the elevator thank you <laughs> this, wasn't that, that sequence almost kind of a play on mr and mrs smith oh i was thinking mission impossible <laughs> just like the holes just how smoothly they were like you said the choreography that is a mr of them. mrs smith thing yeah but yeah that, it there was ball rats <laughs> <laughs> it's not a schooner because <laughs> the escalator it's not a scooter <laughs> that was romantic right passionate yeah <laughs> <laughs> going down the tubes telling you okay my favorite line on the show was rick yelling at michonne hug the wall damn it <laughs> just it just so i know that just a little bickering <laughs> husband and wife situation going on yeah. here but it just goes hand in hand obviously with the commando thing the commando thing without so the commando good. thing it just seems like it's out of nowhere so good. <laughs> you should know better <laughs> well then the chandelier falls on top almost falls on top of him so hug the wall yourself that was some phantom of the opera stuff right there the chandelier falling mm-hmm. on <laughs> by the way kira what makes me look worse than rick and michonne obviously not seeing each other in several years making out in the elevator is that i'll probably do that after a few hours not a few years <laughs> <laughs> let's play this game in the elevator again really same. dave yeah no same yeah that's thank why you. i'm like i know Appreciate we would have been it. making out in the elevator because if it was Appreciate now you. i don't <laughs> have an aversion to making out in the elevator it's making Every out time. in the elevator when it's critically failing and you just need to get down and get out you know what i mean all the more like reason you, you only have view. a minute Not just to do what make you gotta it do faster I mean, they're already in it, so I might as well utilize the time to go. <laughs> they didn't need to Thank control you. it. They just needed to hit the button and then make out when <laughs> until it landed. And then the House of God, it's just it's up to it's all in God's but then hands you now. You miss your stop, <laughs> you miss your floor, and then you're stuck in the basement or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, we make out some more. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> You know how you were noticing the score throughout, I think it was the second episode, the kind of mm-hmm. frontierish sort of soundtrack. Yeah. So this episode was almost highlighted by the fact that there wasn't any music until this flourish at the end of a sentence. You get to the end of the sentence and then there's this musical phrase, the occasional hopeful phrase that I keep hearing throughout these episodes. Some of you are not going to know what I'm talking about, but when you use a delay pedal on your guitar, you can hit a few strings and, and it sort of does a, not like an echo, but it's like you're hitting one note and it's three notes. So that particular phrase, and then there's like this smooth closer at the end. You're going to hear it. Maybe I'll play it in the edit when I release it, but I do want to, people to understand. It's just such a stirring, almost like a goosebump sort of thing once this happens. I'm not going to lie to you, Dave. I didn't even notice it at all. That's why I brought that up in episode two, because I'll notice the songs when they have lyrics, because that's important to me. But score music, a lot of the time, unless it's very impactful, I don't even really notice it unless I'm So you're like, saying you didn't notice it, it at all this episode? I didn't. But episode two, I noticed it immediately. <sighs> and that was such a big deal that I noticed the score immediately. <laughs> like, So am I the only one here? You're the you're that guy. I'm the only one. Kind of. Oh no, I love the score for this show. The musical score, yes, but music with lyrics has played a role in their relationship before, all the mm-hmm. way back to the next world, more than a feeling. 
is playing Ooh. in that opening sequence when he, you see that he's not putting on his wedding band anymore mm-hmm. and Joe's walking around that thin road just moisturizing the way. <laughs> mm. He kind of stepped it up. <laughs> like, mm. the, you know, like, mm. Oh, where was I? <laughs> I don't remember where I was. Anyway. Mm. She wasn't moisturizing. She was flirting. Do y'all know that Jill is the living Rashawn? <laughs> just embodied. It's in her body. <laughs> no, that's my... No, I, she, I created the, she... the Facebook page. The... Oh, okay. Not Facebook too much. Well, now I'm going to link to it. I meant both. I meant that she created the page, but she also is the living Rashawn. <laughs> oh, that's, well, I, I knew that's, that's what she you meant. Were saying. I yeah. was like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, facts. No, nah, he got blown off on a bridge. He's never returned. So, <laughs> not the Rashawn <laughs> Bible. The standalone Michonne, Rashawn? <laughs> yes, she could be Rashawn all by herself. Right. No, I don't, it's like the song no, at the end. That's not. Uh, I don't think it quite works that way. That math is not math. And you, know um, <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. I don't know. What? This got so weird. You know I, what I, mean. I know. Okay. I know. Hey, come on. The swapping of seats and making out while they're swapping the seats. That I did. That I did. Come on. That one I was like, yeah. I don't love it because I don't love PDA. I don't know why, but it makes me feel socially like uncomfortable. But... So, but that part I was like, all right, I get, I okay. get it. Acceptable. <laughs> yeah. If it was a bunch of walkers on the street, they would have made it right there. Honestly, that's <laughs> that was a mm-hmm. sense of urgency. Like, oh no, not right now. The building's falling. It's I guess we better go. They are like, now in okay. that honeymoon phase of their relationship. They realize how they feel about each other. They realize they both want the same thing. They're happy that they have each other back. This is the Walker honeymoon, guys. <laughs> Just give them. Maybe two to five miles of distance, and they're pulling over. Guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I might have an objection. <laughs> Get home to your family. <laughs> anyway, who cares? It's fine. I don't care. I'll, I'm just happy to be in the back seat. Okay, I realized what I was about to say. What? Along for the. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to be in the backseat just creeping. This is so well, I was going to say along for the ride, but along for the ride would have sufficed. <laughs> just, but you had to say backseat, like the ethanol. <laughs> that the close? That's also suggestive, actually. Oh, do yeah. tell. Was it because it's denatured? <laughs> denatured well, alcohol? What ride are you going on? Huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm here for all of it. In the back of a Volkswagen. <laughs> Trying to holler at me. Uh, I but got still. that. I got that. <laughs> Another mall rats reference. Another for mall rats. Yep. Yeah. So we were talking about the thin walkers earlier, and then I cut you guys off. Doesn't that idea that crops fail? We've seen that as early as season nine with the saviors and their crops mm-hmm. failing. Alexandra is starving by season eleven, essentially. Ten C eleven. Commonwealth comes in, solves some of those problems, essentially, but. The greater problem is we've seen wildlife migratory patterns in animals, birds, etc. change. And we've also seen crops change. But maybe the show is trying to tell us, along with this tipping point that they've projected with Omaha and why they had to destroy it, and then Campus Colony too, which just breaks my brain. My greater question is, does this world also include a bigger threat that affects everyone, just like the walkers did at the end of season eight? Oh, they're the threat, the walkers when he spares Negan. Well, these are just real life problems from before the conveniences of modern times. Well, I was just thinking something even bigger than that. Does this dead world include the possibility that crops are going to fail and they're not going to be as easy to plow or easy to grow, or there's something in the soil where there's not enough nutrients, essentially, even without all the people and all the dead. Well, they're also being repeatedly trampled by walkers that are going mm-hmm. in these patterns around. How can anything really grow if the walkers are just going to trample all over them every three months or however long the cycle takes to reset? Because of their migratory patterns. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's, mm-hmm. A, that's another issue. So the, I guess the greater question then is, the show often tells us that, let's go back to The Walking Dead. The, one, the big lesson that we learned from The Walking Dead is we are The Walking Dead for as long as we need to be to survive, right? But I think the show moved on quickly from that to The Walking Dead allows you to be the person that you were meant to be. Do we all agree with that? Okay. Mm -hmm. So just like that premise, because people often confuse the show or I don't know, and I don't blame them either. Bridget, you've often brought up, I watch The Walking Dead because my life sucks. (laughs) Sorry, like normal life, normal life sucks by comparison. Yeah. The opportunity to, to escape that normality. It's 
If only I could get back to a time in which things were simpler, then none of this other stuff would be so burdensome. I wouldn't be worried right. about having enough money or a nice car. Or I can't afford a house because the housing market sucks or none of that would matter anymore. So there's something appealing about that. I mean, I'm not just like out here like my life sucks because I don't think that I have a great life, but that's the appeal. Why well, I like watching Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> <laughs> which we completely cut out of that episode by the way <laughs> so, we started talking about shirtless michael landon and it went off the rails <laughs> that's the entry point right that's what hooks people in but you you come here for the survivalism but you end up realizing oh it's more than just that you can be the person you were meant to be but the walking dead also moves on it was about survival we are the walking dead no 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 michonne puts her, sh- her sword down and says survival isn't enough Let's find a reason to thrive. Let's look beyond survival. We can do better than that. Eventually, I want to live in a world where one day I don't have to pick up the sword again. So, okay, there's that thing. We've already encountered the, I have to become the monster to kill the monsters. We meet people out on the road that are horrible, and we have to do horrible things to them so that they don't come back for us. But then we also reach the point where we get to Negan, and then we have to decide, okay, How long can we keep being the monster to get the monster? Because we did that at the satellite station, and that might not have been the best decision. Okay, so we figured out we have to punish at least the head (laughs) and keep them alive so that the others will fall in line. Okay, now we move on from that point. There's the greater question, I'm trying to phrase this just right, of the CRM. And normally, you would see what the CRM is trying to do from a survivalist perspective, like pure utilitarianism. If they see a problem, let's say with crops or with scarcity, and they decide that, okay, it's destroying one colony or settlement so that a greater amount of future people can be born into this world and have a better chance at a future. But I see the idea of Michonne going for Rick or trying to bring Rick back home as an allegory for what is a world worth if we have to murder a bunch of innocent people in order for our species to persist. There's a little bit of a tension in seeing the bigger, bigger picture that that we have now. And what does it to mean to live in this world if we have to kill too many people in order to live, in, in, in order to survive? It's not like they're trying to repopulate the world. They want to keep it contained at the 10,000 or whatever number they've determined. Or the 200,000. Yeah, this is the, yeah. is the appropriate number. Well, I, I wonder too, because they have like a, what, a 500 year plan, they said? Mm-hmm. But their whole idea is to repopulate eventually un, under their terms, being the last light to control this repopulation or resettlement etc of the planet maybe yeah but they just want people that'll follow orders they don't want anything else well that aside yeah and, well and i don't know because the military portion of the crm was only supposed to be in charge for the first 10 years mm-hmm. and then the cr was supposed to actually take over the civic republic themselves yes. i get my question is is there going to be tension or are we going to see possibly even if they touch on it a little bit the pure utilitarian vision of maybe having to kill a bunch of people in order to save the world michonne sort of says this when people try to go save the world on their own terms, it often turns out bad for them. It's Ramona the Pest. <laughs> she has great intentions, but it gets her into trouble. They often go awry. Well, that's the CRM. You could see the CRM like that. And the tension between that and coming home and being an individual, living on your own terms, growing your own food, but the possibility that you and your generations may die down the line. Because if you don't have that big 10-year, 500-year plan... What hope in there is there in humanity? That's idiotic. I see that there's, <laughs> a te- idiotic. But there's a tension there, but that's not purely idiotic. It's a concern. This is what I don't understand. Like, why do they care if there's people out there who can survive on their own? They can survive on their own. Great. They care because it's a threat to them having control. So this isn't about repopulation. This is about repopulation under our control only which is some big brother government crap that I don't really want to talk about because it's going to make me angry. (laughs) Well, see, that's the thing. I like the tension. I don't need the answer. I just like that these two big, bigger themes that are now coming to the Walking Dead universe. Viva la revolution, dude. Like, I want to see, like, people (laughs) in the Civic Republic, like, bro, you said 10 years, and it has been more than that. It is 500. (laughs) You said 10, and... (laughs) <laughs> when I was younger, my friend used to have these huge house parties and his mom would come home really drunk from the bar. She didn't care that everybody was drinking at these house parties at her house. Anyway, she would always come home super drunk. And there was one year that it was Halloween. She was dressed as a chicken. And the thing that she used to yell every time she came home when everybody was wasted, all these teens are wasted in her house was, Kyle, you said 10. 
you said 10 so when i just said 10 that really reminded me of her in the chicken costume <laughs> like the chicken things like going crazy on her head and she's like so it was 10. a halloween party yeah. and the crm are all dressed up in chicken costumes <laughs> yes. going to the military you said ten. like yeah. and there's signs you said 10 you said 10 yeah i <laughs> No, like I would love, a, you know what, that could be its own spinoff and I'd watch it. <laughs> you said 10 is the new spinoff. Yeah. The Walking Dead, you, said, you 10. said 10. <laughs> Why are there 20 drunk kids in my yard right now? Yeah, exactly. And that's the post, that's the key art. Mm -hmm. And then right out front is Kyle's mom. Kyle's is that his mom. name? Sorry. Yeah, Kyle's mom <laughs> is the protagonist of the story. Her name's, Actually, she might her be name's the villain. Wendy. I love her. <laughs> Not important. It's important. <laughs> it's the chicken costume. This is an image. I it's have. an image <laughs> but listen we've seen versions of this right the commonwealth how they run alexandria how they run it's almost the exact opposite night and day the crm all these all these other setups even the hilltop had its own formula but these were limited settlements where they did things their own way they had ideas about how they wanted to grow the future but like i said in a previous episode maybe the crm is blowing smoke up over everybody's asses maybe they don't have the numbers down the way they think they do even though they say they've run it a million times over and the answers come out the same assuming it's true that's concerning there's a lot of people that go out there knowing that there's a chance that they have a future and so hearing that you don't unless you follow a, a particular plan for whatever reason i don't know the reason I'm just hearing things. Bees will shut down. The bees, not the A's, not the anus. I thought you were the, talking the about bees. actual bees. Yeah, no, the bees, <laughs> the bees like, and the what? A's. That really is a the current anus and the problem is, is the lack of bees, but I don't think it's in the same context. Inherently. Maybe that's that's how the zombie apocalypse started. No bees. Well, to be fair, other cross pollinators came in to step it up. That's why I was introduced to the hummingbird moth, which is a terrifying creature that I absolutely hate, but... They are cross pollinators, so. So are the zombies, right? They have the pollen yeah, on them. Yeah, they're cross pollinators. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> cross pollinating. Anyway, so whatever <laughs> it is, this this tipping point that they speak of, I'm just saying the tension there might be. You know, it's not worth living in a world. Let humanity die if I can't live the way I want to live. There's that tension as well. What is life worth living if I can't live it freely, essentially? Because isn't that the, what the Walking Dead universe was supposed to be? What you were meant to be? rather than following somebody's 500 year plan to repopulate the earth what do i care i'm not going to be here this world is st still dead there's no cure project of votus was a bust i don't, i just think there's some tension there and i'm glad that you fought back because <laughs> otherwise guess, this I, now been, i'm like bro this would have been dead bro, air. we went so far <laughs> off like let's just reel it back reel it back in I guess all I'm saying really is that the walking dead from its inception until now has evolved and these themes have evolved. Sure. It's not about survival. It's about thriving. It's about. Well, yeah, of course. I think this is one of those themes that's being that introduced. Would be human nature. It's not that you want to get back to where you were. It's just that if everything shut down suddenly, even for me, who's someone who's like, I wish it just all would because screw it. Even for me. OK, would I miss air conditioning? Yes, dude. For sure. Ice cream? Uh, 100%. Not really. My digestive system would probably be thankful. Hot if I didn't. showers. You still want it, I didn't though. didn't have it. Hot showers. Hot yeah, exactly. Hot showers. Hot uh, showers. Oh, I can go inside and avoid mosquitoes. Sounds great. You know what I mean? So even me, someone who's like, <laughs> screw this, uh, end it. It's Shut it down. <laughs> shut, shut it shut down. Shut the whole thing down. It's fine. Just start over. Even I would be trying to get back to some semblance of comfort. Right. Yeah. You couldn't help yourself. If a part of you will still try to uh, want to achieve more, essentially. Yeah, well, that's... You want to do better. That's our drive. For you or humans. for your kids. When we don't right? have that, we struggle immensely, I think you can see. When you don't have something to work towards and you can't learn to be content in what you do have, that's how we get to where we're at now. Well, it's a balancing act, right? Because humanity cannot help itself, essentially. We're almost evolutionarily compelled towards some sort of prestige or mastering a talent at the very least or trying to achieve something more especially in a world of scarcity we innovate our way out of basic problems sure but say. that's not an everybody thing i've recently tried hiring people and i'm gonna tell you it's just not. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even show up <laughs> like, listen i have an i have an answer so, for that so but that's too funny <laughs> So no, I always say that when I took my first management job, nobody ever told me that 99% of my problems was going to be my employees. People that work for you are the worst. But to put a cap on it, we don't live in a world of scarcity. So the 
desire no, to achieve to a, innovate. We live to, in a time of surplus and overconsumption, Dave. Well, where needs are being met largely beyond That's, met. let's be fair beyond met for a lot well, of people and yeah and, and conveniences are now essentials essentially like cell mm-hmm. phones etc yeah showers working <laughs> working refrigerators i mean take a look at our world versus any third world country and people here are entitled to those things and without them it's like eh, it's a status issue it's a right. anyway we're getting but off topic you get the you get the point we're the worst <laughs> Actually goes to Sharon D's quandary. There's a weirdness in the mechanization and the advancement and the militarization and not being on the prairie <laughs> in surviving. So I, again, there's tension between this and that. Survival. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a word. Survival. Look it up. You'll Surviving. see my picture next I'm to playing, it. <laughs> I'm playing that in Scrabble. Survival. Yeah. Survivor survivoraling. Yeah, my picture will be there and it says the act of not surviving. <laughs> <laughs> the act of the act of live action role playing surviving. My picture. My beard. Like a it's hipster. Time to cosplay as a person who has their shit together. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Great. Now I have to beep that out. Sorry. Thank you so much. It's fine. So much work this episode. <laughs> Kidding. Hey, you got it. <laughs> You're yeah. done. <laughs> I think we're done. Yeah. I think we're done. Mm. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> hey, I'm done. <laughs> Cue, at this point, the screensaver comes on, the pipe screensaver. <laughs> Just, we're, we're done and dave knows what it's called because he's a nerd 3d pipes yeah because i have desperately wanted the after dark screensaver pack that cost money <laughs> i think it was 45 dollars for the full three pack the next episode is rated tvma with the letters oh. l s and v language and let me just sexual suggestions and violence violence mm-hmm. Sexual, what did I just say? Sexual suggestions? Sexual situations. <laughs> survival, survivor ring, sexual situations. A book by David Cameo. Oh my God. I'm so tongue tied right now. Okay. Let's, well, let's tie a yellow ribbon Definitely around the old dark. oak tree. Mm-hmm. That's what she said. All right, well, that's why I said it. <laughs> we can end it here and we can tag on our intros and outros. We love doing those things. I'm not doing it now. That's fine. Even though I really want to. No. I really want Don't to, but I won't. Don't you dare. It's Don't. such a treat because I get to do little things that make people laugh during it. Or you guys may try to make me laugh, but I am a stone. I'm a rock. You're a robot. <laughs> I'm in. You're a Roomba. <laughs> <laughs> They're about the same height. He's so short. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm an earlier on Roomba because they're not thin. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, everybody each will say who they are. So I don't know. Because like otherwise just, people are just going to go, hey, Bridget. He just points. <laughs> you, now you go. <laughs> You're right, I'm just going to go by what's on the screen. So <laughs> me. <laughs> Sakira, Rachel, Jill, <laughs> Sharon D, Bridget. Because I'm looking up like this. So, okay, ready? So, Aren't you always looking up? <laughs> just gonna stop recording now. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the collaboration between the ones who live a TWD podcast and Squawking Dead. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. It was such a pleasure to break down yet another episode with Takira, who sat in on many episodes of Squawking Dead, primarily The Walking Dead Daryl Dixon and many episodes of The Walking Dead Dead City. And it was a real treat to get Jill's takes on this particular episode, referencing old episodes of The Walking Dead. I really hope we get to do this again. Both Kirsten and Sarah Beth have joined in on episodes of Squawking Dead as well, you can head over to our podcast, Squawking Dead, to listen to those episodes. And if you haven't already, do yourself a favor and subscribe to either or both The Ones Who Live a TWD Podcast's YouTube channel, Spotify, or whatever podcast platform you prefer. I've been your narrator, David Cameo. You were joined by Takira Lawrence, Jill Roby, Cosmo Zero Nine, Rachel Burt, Sharon D, aka Blazy Gardner, and Bridget. KO-FI.com slash Punky Brewster. That's P-U-N-K-Y-B-R-U-I-S-E-T-E-R. And watch out for another episode of The Ones Who Live a TWD Podcast 